years, he was an informant spilling. For years, he was. For, for years, he was an informant spilling the secrets of the Chicago mob to the FBI. The story of Red Women. I was told by some people at the time they put out a million dollar contract on my head. Hello, folks, and welcome, Adam. Here we are on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, 2022. And my guest, Let's Adam, go, right? my partner, really, <laughs> my partner in crime here. <laughs> hey, it's all good. Welcome in, everybody. How are you doing today, Red? I'm doing real good. It's awesome. very warm here. It's always it's always warm in Florida. It's always nice in Florida. No, it's it, we had that cold snap, and now all of a sudden it's eighty degrees out. So, <laughs> oh, it's kind of cold out here. It's cooling off anyway. So, so you want to read some more of this book that you wrote? This nobody cares and what I did about it. Go for it, Adam. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off next week, and uh, let's uh, see what goes on because. I think uh, today's going to be an interesting uh, interesting read from what I've skimmed. Marshall Caifano and Ray Ryan. Marshall Caifano and Ray Ryan. Raymond J. Ryan was a prominent Palm Springs real estate developer and businessman who's had a partnership with William Holden and several other movie stars, establishing the Mount Kenya. Mount Kenya. 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 Sorry. Kenya. Kenya, Kenya, Mount Kenya Sapphire Club in Kenya, Africa. He also made millions upon millions of dollars from mineral rights leases on farms in the Midwest. He purchased mineral rights from farmlands in Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, and surrounding states. The farmers were thinking that he was looking for oil. He did find some oil, but he hit the real pay dirt there in a far <laughs> form of natural gas. This exceeded his wealth and earn, uh, wealth earned from all the oil wells that he had drilled in Texas and Oklahoma. Between his real estate and all of his energy producing activities, he made more than enough money to live very comfortably for the rest of his life. I learned about Ryan's dealings, Ray Ryan's dealings with the outfit from the mouth of Marshall Caifano himself. Marshall told me that Ray Ryan had sent him to prison because he and Johnny Delmonico sat in the back of his limo with him. Ray had a, a been a frequent and very degenerate gambler in Las Vegas and had some very heavy gambling debts. He had taken juice loans to pay them off and Marsh had been sent to collect them and set in the terms of his payout. <clears throat> he had owed about $850,000, but that wasn't enough money to warrant a hit on him. They had promised Ray Ryan that if he he would give them a million dollars every year, then they would let him live. Hold on. He owed them $850,000, and they said, if you give us a million a year, we'll let you live? Yeah, because they said, go ahead and kill him. They gave the order to kill him. And he said, no, I'm just going to juice him. I'm going to, I'm going to, if you give me a million dollars, you only owe me $850,000. But if I'm, if, if you want me to let you live, give me a million every year. And it'll come to my pocket. They would take the eight hundred fifty thousand, give it to the people he owed, that he was collecting it for, and keep the change. And every year he'd get a million bucks. Why would somebody agree to give a million dollars a year if he only owes eight hundred fifty thousand? I'd say here's the eight hundred fifty. Because you got a gun to his head. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. When the, the car was to a stop. Man. Ray jumped out of his limo right into the middle of Palm Springs, California, and ran to the nearest payphone. He called the FBI to volunteer some very helpful information to them if they would go prosecute the men who were threatening his life. The feds took him up on the offer. A while, that'd be my first move, man. I'd run right to a damn payphone. A while later, Marshall was in, indicted and convicted along with Johnny Delmonico for extortion of Ray Ryan. He was then sentenced to serve time in Atlanta Federal Penitentiary where he sold with Johnny Rogers, whom several FBI re agents referred to as Marshall's prison wife, Rogers. Roger, what? 
Yeah. So he was his bitch. He was, a, he, was he was he I guess I I if you knew Rogers, he was weird. I mean very weird. What do you mean by weird? He was a hillbilly. He was a hillbilly from uh South Florida. He he was he had he was like a dog. He had no shame. <laughs> okay, okay. So Rogers helped him procure an early release. Marshall went after Ryan with Joey Lombardo's permission. He was out for revenge as Ray Ryan. Uh, he was out for revenge as Ray Ryan, in his estimate, had taken several years of his life from him. In 1977, he took 19, ten years out of his life. Yeah, that's a, that's a long time. Uh, Ray had just finished out one of his workouts at an Evansville, Indiana health club he frequented, and got into his Lincoln Mark V to leave. As he started the car, it violently exploded sending pieces of the vehicle hundreds of feet in every direction and killing the man almost instantly. At least that's what the police report read. Although a suspect, Marshall was never arrested for the bombing. I was somewhat shocked at the news of Ryan's death because Johnny Rogers had been playing with my remote control device when I was installing it in my garage door opener. He was trying to see if an 18 volt garage door opener could be powered to a 12 volt auto battery and detonate a blasting cap. This gave me somewhat of an insight and suspicion as to how the murder occurred. By use of a garage door opener detonated remotely, despite the new reports that a the news reports that a bomb was connected directly to the ignition. The murder remains an open case to this day, but I think it is clear who did it. Johnny Rogers debriefing with Hank Schmidt um, was debriefing with Hank Schmidt of the FBI confirmed those facts. Johnny Rogers story. So Johnny, uh, I forget what I wrote about him. <laughs> Johnny Rogers. Well, we're going to find out. Real name was Alva Johnson Rogers. He told me that his mother named him that after his biological father, a Pentecostal preacher named Alva Johnson, with whom she'd had an affair. He was born and raised in Kissimmee, Florida, in Polk County. He claimed to be a natural born pyromaniac, telling me. That in eight, eight years old, his parents bought him a chemistry set, and he blew up their barn and burned it to the ground with a chemical concoction he devised. This was his first hit, his first run-in with the law. He was in and out of juvenile detention throughout his youth, owing the many fires he'd start. Oh, sorry, he was in and out of de uh, juvenile detention throughout his youth, owing to the many fires he'd started. Uh, and that was what he had instead of a formal education. Later in his, on, in his life, among other criminal ventures, he graduated to grand theft auto and bank robbery. So you go from starting fires to robbing <laughs> banks. That's what happens. The guys in the Grand Avenue crew always referred to him as, quote, the hillbilly. Because of his deep southern drawl, rural upbringing, low moral values, an obvious lack of education. He was never really accepted by the crew, but everyone tolerated him because Marshall brought him. And Marshall brought him because he met him in prison. That's why he brought him. All right. Well, no, he, he got his time cut short. I think they talked, I talked about it. He got, he was a uh, prison lawyer where he used to live in some of Marshall's time and he got him murdered. So he brought him to Chicago with him. So this guy with no education, they call the hillbilly, was a prison lawyer? He used to, that's all, he was a sponge. He used to go down to the law library and read all these things, and he got Marshall's time cut short. So Marshall got out and got a lawyer and got him out and said, I'm bringing you to Chicago with me. Okay. All right. So Rogers helped him procure an Thinking early release. Back his, old line, his old territories and everything. That was the line. Rogers helped him procure an early release. So now it, because he did, that's what he was. He was a prison lawyer. He studied law while he was there, but he was uneducated as a kid. Totally. Okay. When I first met Rogers while building my store, I noticed that he was driving a brand new Cadillac Eldorado with Florida license plates on it. 
Marshall Caifano had given him the money to lease it upon his release on parole from the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. As formally uneducated as he was, he would spend all of his free time in prison reading law books, which made him into what we refer to as a jailhouse lawyer. Ah, there it is. As a result of his learnings, he was able to appeal Marshall's prison time by several years and helped him get out early. I was jumping ahead. He would refer to himself as being his boy and that Marshall was his guy. They, they were cellmates and documented as prison lovers. He even openly confirmed this fact to me and others around me. This guy had no shame whatsoever and was involved in several bisexual relationships over the years, sometimes just to avoid doing jail time. He was involved in relationships to avoid doing jail time? Yes. What the hell does that mean? It's complicated. I didn't want to put it in print. <laughs> okay. Enough said. I'll ask you off air. He was genuinely proud of the crimes he had committed throughout his lengthy career and even testified of that fact under, uh, under oath in federal court in the family secrets trial. Uh, <clears throat> under cross-examination, Rick Halperin, there's a picture of Rick Halperin. That was Joey's lawyer. Lombardo's Joey Lombardo's lawyer. lawyer had labeled him as a bust-out loser to which Rogers responded, quote, I did 11 years for bank robbery. Is that heavy enough? As he grinned and chuckled. Rick replied with a follow-up comment. I'm glad you're not modest. The bank robbery is probably the highlight of your career, which Rogers <laughs> confirmed by saying, well, sort of. The guy was one strange nut to crack, but at least he was a, for a forthright. In reality, Rogers got away with very few crimes it seemed that he was nearly always caught. For example, he robbed a bank in New Jersey and broke into a house that was vacant to order to hide. It all happened on a snowy winter's night. The flakes were falling so fast, he thought his footprints would be covered by the fresh storm. He was right about his footprints as they weren't what led authorities to him. He told me, I never did figure out how the police found me in that house. He overlooked the simple fact that the stolen car he used for the heist was parked a mere two blocks away, and they searched abandoned buildings until they found him. We used about every joke we used to joke about him, saying, "One more IQ point, and he could be a stop sign." If he hadn't been uh, California's, uh, sorry, if he hadn't been Caifano's cellmate, he would have never been part of the Grand Avenue crew, and he and he all knew, all of us knew it. Frank Schweiss told me one time on tape, you see what happened to Marsh? You see what happened to Marsh because of that idiot? <laughs> Shit. Rogers testified in Family Secrets trial that he had committed arson to profit the, at the request of Anthony Pelicano, not the fixer. Oh, Tell yeah. Me. What? Yeah. When I That's went to, when I went to meet... Uh, when I went to meet with Marshall, with, with Pelicano, who was with? Johnny Rogers. Okay. Once, uh, one was a house in the suburbs, and the other place was a restaurant not far from my place where he had tried to give me $1,500 to do it for him. But naturally, I declined the offer. It seemed that no matter what ideas he came up with, they never seemed to work out the way he planned. Everyone tired of him and his failed schemes, including manufacturing of quaaludes with my equipment. He felt unwanted by the crew, which was the contributing factor in his approaching me to be bought out of his part uh, of the take from my place. After the buyout, he relocated to Texas and got involved smuggling drugs into uh, in from Mexico. Hank, my FBI handler, told me that he had arrested Rogers for his drug trafficking exploits down to Texas. He had gone there to interview him. Rogers was looking at life in prison, but he still had something to negotiate a deal with, his connection and knowledge about the Grand Avenue crew. He went into witness protection program and later testified against Caifano on a stolen stock deal and Joe Lombardo on another case, separate case. Hank told me, what he had said during the interview. You have to talk to this guy named Red. 
He knows everything about everybody. Rogers never knew that Hank was just comparing my notes with his statements. When Hank returned, he called and told me about the debriefing. We both got a laugh when he said that Rogers guy told him, you ought to get a hold of that red guy. He knows everything about everybody. Hank and I laughed about the whole exchange for a full five minutes. He told me that he had a real hard time keeping a straight face as Rogers babbled about uh, on about this red guy. Rogers was then placed into witness protection, uh, witness protection security program, which federal officers term WITSEC. WITSEC. Okay. Let me wet my whistle there. Joe Lombardo makes a point and lives up to his nickname. Joe Lombardo, JL, earned his reputation as Joey the Clown for a number of reasons. Well known are the frivolous protests and motions in the courtrooms, but less lesser known are some of his exploits and its philosophies on how things should be run by the crew. JL had the good sense to try to help everyone learn how to operate as not to draw too much attention to themselves or their activities. Let me explain what I mean with a true story to help illustrate my point. This is a picture right here of Joe Lombardo. Okay, we all know what Joe JL looks like. Mike Switek was a big, beefy concrete contractor who knew a lot about buildings. He did hard and heavy work. He was also demolitions and explosives expert, a talent that he only used when he was called upon to employ it. Though his various exploits, he brought the bought the flashiest gold link chain ever. <laughs> his name was Bushelhead. That's what they nicknamed him. That's what yep. Frank Lotta called him, Bushelhead. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen, and Mikey had it custom made to his specifications. The thing was massive, and the individual links that were joined in the necklace were so large that we joked he probably could have towed a truck with it. It weighed around three pounds and was his pride and joy. Like a three-pound chain, seriously? It was, yeah, and nuggets that were that big. Hey, Mr. T? <laughs> God. Anyone who got close up to him noticed it. People from a good distance could easily make out the shapes and tell they were extravag that was an extravagant oddity. It was so over the top that it actually resembled what might be regarded as cartoon jewelry. I think you get the picture. Mikey was Mikey always attracted a lot of re uh, of reactions when he would strut the streets with that novelty firmly fixed around his neck. It also made him very popular with the ladies, and he frequently got the best looking girls to go out with him. It was hard to overlook the fact that he was a member of the Grand Avenue crew and must have purchased it with ill-gotten funds. He had it only for a few months, but he got a lot of use out of it. JL asked him if he could borrow it for a vacation. He told him he was going down to Miami Beach, Florida, and wanted to use it to help attract and impress the gals. Mikey was a real, real bind. Michael, Mikey was in a real bind because he certainly could not deny the request of his boss. JL fully expected him to comply and accepted the chain without hesitation. Mikey turned pale as he handed it over. I learned that Joey had been waiting for the right opportunity to approach him, and it was time to teach Mikey a lesson. Joey returned a couple of weeks later, but he never approached Mikey to return the chain. Mikey couldn't build up the nerve to ask him about it directly, so he got the other guys to inquire about his chain and when JL was going to return it. This went on for several months. <laughs> One weekend evening, while Joey was sitting by the pool in a chase lounge, at Jimmy Cozo's place, Mike finally got up the nerve and asked him what happened to his chain. Joey reached in his shirt pocket and pulled out a very petite gold necklace that could have been worth more than $80 and handed it to Mike. Mike looked at it and said, this is not my chain. Joey, while leaning back in the chair, puffing on his cigar and blowing smoke rings, said, sure it is. Doesn't that look like the same one that you gave to me? Mike retarded, no, mine was a lot bigger. Maybe 50 times the size of this one. That's when Joey said, I don't know about that salt water. It must have shrunk it. <laughs> All of us who Typical were clown. laughing while Joey kept a very sober face. Needless to say, Mike's chain was never mentioned again. 
In his own joking way, he had taught him a lesson. You don't look like you are bigger than your boss. And Joey was the boss. I recall him sitting by the pool in that same chair, blowing smoke rings from his cigar, saying, I'm a shining star and there is no others. Oh, ego, man. Holy cow. That's after he did that, that famous picture with the suit where he yes. was wearing a suit. That was uh -huh. right after that picture. Got it. I am a shining star and there is no other. Mikey, Mikey must have forgotten the lectures that we all heard previously to this about driving expensive vehicles. At one time, long before the incident with the chain, we were all gathered at the same location at the bequest of Joe Lombardo. He went off on a rant about all the people he had to drive around in a 10-year-old beat-up dented Dodge while others, well beneath in the echelon, were driving new Cadillacs. He told everyone, if you... if." If I have to drive around in that piece of shit, who the hell do you think you fucking guys are that you can own a, own a better car than I can? Some of the people hung their heads in shame and disposed of their Cadillacs, almost immediately replacing them with smaller used cars. Joey specifically said at that meeting, this kid is exempt while pointing at me. After all, I was a legitimate businessman and could account for the earnings that paid for my luxurious cars which many of the crew's tax statements showed they were barely scraping by. That's it, based on their primary job's earnings. It also bears mention that Joey had only filed taxes for making an apparent uh, approximately $36,000 a year. The IRS uh, has been one of those worst enemies of the outfit. Another example of how Joe Lombardo lived up to his nickname happened in November of 92 when he was released from prison. He took out newspaper ads in major Chicago area newspapers, which read, I am Joe Lombardo. I have been released on parole from federal prison. I never took a secret oath with guns and daggers, pricked my finger, drew blood, or burned paper to join a criminal organization. If anyone hears my name in connection with any criminal activity, please notify the FBI, local police, and my parole officer, Ron Kumke. Kumke. Really? He did this in, re in response to the several cover stories which had been in the headlines because of his release was in the major news um, story on both the TV and the papers. Joey came, quote, out of the patch. This phrase referred to the very poor Italian neighborhood, Italian American neighborhood on Chicago's west side. He started out as a burglar, and his specialty was taking down big businesses and ransacking them, along with his pals Frank Schweiss and Jimmy Cozo. He was a collector of specialty construction equipment and tools that could be used for both legitimate and nefarious ventures. He would loan them out, and in place of rent, he would get a piece of the action from each job. This kept 20%. him... <laughs> he didn't know what was going on, and he got acquainted with a lot of the powerful people. Smart. Hey, man, I own the drills that you could drill safes with, and I got all the bits, and I got everything you need. I'll rent you the thing if you got to go do a job because you know the uh, score. I use the word rent. I'll let you use it, but I get 20%. Gotcha. Okay. He brought up, he brought up many of his childhood buddies in the outfit crews. Uh, Larry and Joe Petit, Irv Weiner, Phil Aldericio, the Spalatro brothers, and several others that died along the way. This helped propel him into a position of power and influence that made the more established older gangsters double down on their positions and try and keep the young Turks out. I should note that it was reported to me from several of the made guys I knew that this statement came from Tony Accardo's mouth himself in speaking of the young Turks. Quote, these guys all came out of the same place that you did and all have the same skills. Why not give them a piece of the pie now? Because they will eventually overtake us and be running the show anyway. It's true. Mob guys who could think progressively were adaptable and made the transition and made through transition times. And those who didn't were eventually murdered or went to prison and died there. And there's a picture of the Last Supper, including Joe Lombardo, who spent the what last. What did you on? Last Supper. That's JL right back there. The only guy with a suit. 
That's right. The only one with the suit. Irv Liner and his contributions to the outfit. Irwin Irv Liner was a profiter for the mob. He was an earner. He was close childhood friend to Jack Ruby's older brother. Jack Ruby was the man who was famous for gunning down Lee Harvey Oswald, President JFK alleged assassin. He was so well acquainted with Jack that he even summoned, he was even summoned before the Warren Commission for questioning regarding the assassination. Let me just say that he knew a lot more about the events of those days than the public ever did. It should be known that Red Dorfman, father of Alan Dorfman and Jimmy Hoffa were close friends and associates. All of them had immense financial gain from JFK's murder. No one will ever know his role in the death of JFK. Irv also came from the patch and was longtime associate of Joey Lombardo. Because of his Jewish ethnicity, he was never able to become a full-fledged made boss. But that formal title, that was really all that was missing. His influence and authority were immense. He had a great mind and propensity for schemes that resulted in big payouts. He was a licensed ba as a bail bondsman and used his American bonding company, Weenie World Corporation, and Danny Seifert's Plastic Matic Products Fiberglass Factory to launder money and generate business leads for outfit interests. His peers also referred to him as the rabbi, partly as the reflection of his Jewish heritage, but also an homage to his truly gifted intellect. Early in his career, he controlled the Chicago outfit's interest in Havana, Cuba. He frequently, frequently went to Havana to oversee their casinos. While there, he also wrote bonds for businessmen such as Jimmy Hoffa and other mob-connected individuals. He was a genuine powerhouse, genuine powerhouse in every sense of the word. Irv was a short guy, around five foot three, but very stocky and well-built. So many other guys, like so many other guys in the crew, he had been an amateur boxer in his younger years and had picked up fighting skills from the streets. His best attribute was making money for the mob. He was extremely creative. He had a close relationship with Felix Aldericio, a.k.a. Milwaukee Phil, but an even closer relationship with Tony the Ant Spilatro. They built Circus Circus Casino together out of Las Vegas. They built Circus Circus Casino together out in Las Vegas with the help of Jimmy Hoffa, Hoffa's Teamsters Pension Fund loan. They skimmed as much as they could from it and shared the rest with the Grand Avenue crew. I suppose I would say in my own words, you see, that's how it's done, Chicago style. Irv had a modest home in Nile, Illinois that he shared with his daughter. At one time, he purchased a Boeing 707 to travel back and forth from Las Vegas to Chicago or Deming, New Mexico. The Teamsters had a factory in Deming where they manufactured model trucks that would be sent out to the local union chapters. The local unions would have to buy the models at top price. When Irv got a hold of the plant, they also molded five gallon. Wait a second. Let me just back this up. What do you mean the Teamsters had a factory in Deming where they manufactured model trucks? What do you mean model trucks? Someone like took trucks a loan or? from the somebody took a loan from the Teamsters Union, and they were manufacturing these plastic trucks, and they would call every local or send one out to every local, and then give them a bill, and they would have to you know buy them, and they made lots of money on them. But the Teamsters for closed on it. Jim closed on it. When he did, it went to Tony Spalaccio. It was a vacant building by then. There was nothing there. A little toy trucks. Like a little model truck. Yeah, but it only cost, it only cost like maybe 58 cents to make them. They send them out for $9.95, $10.95, and then they just mail them to the locals and then send them a bill. And they had to pay it. Okay. The team, okay, got it. <clears throat> okay, so it's you guys are all going to buy this truck this year. <laughs> this is your Christmas gift from us to you. You send us $10, we send you 58 cents, and we pay the shipping on it. <laughs> Does every every member of the local has to buy one of these? Is that how no, it works? every local. Every local. Every local, every local had to buy one. How yeah, many locals are there? 
Oh, at that time? Thousand? Yeah. Maybe two, three hundred thousand. Oh my gosh. Locals. Okay. Wow. When Irv got a hold of the plant, they also molded five gallon plastic pails. A lot of money was lawn a lot of money was laundering from the Teamsters pension fund through a plant in Deming, and in its own way, Irv was a genius. Like most mob bosses, I often wondered why uh, what they could have accomplished if they had set their minds to legitimate businesses. Many of them were born into the slums and never had a chance uh, for a lot of formal education, but I am confident they could have done very well for themselves if they wanted to pursue advanced degrees at the university levels. Wow. Stolen Westinghouse stock. Marshall Caifano had been working with Johnny Rogers on some counterfeit stock certificates. The real ones were stolen from Chicago O'Hare's airport. Their value was a whopping $3 million. Marshall asked me to go back to my bank and take out a loan for as much as I could using the Westinghouse stock as collateral. He said, quote, they'll never refuse you, a straight businessman, but someone like me would never get a loan, and I'm still on parole. I called my FBI handler, Hank, and told him about it. He assumed he made the report. I assumed he made the report. I put off Marshall and did not go along with his plan for me. Later in 79, Caifano went to a financial institution in Miami, and the banker who made him the loan called the FBI and told him that the stolen stocks were there, the genuine articles. Marshall was arrested and held in West Palm Beach. He wrote a letter to me. He wrote to me. He wrote me a letter telling me how we could still do business together. His nephew was an attorney. Uh, sorry, with his nephew, through his nephew, an attorney. Um, by the time he got the letter got to me, Joe Lombardo sent Phil Amato to pick up the $250 per week I was still paying in street tax. After a few weeks of collections, Phil told me Joey was asking about the factory. I told him that Rogers took, o took it over and Marshall told him to cut me out of the business. JL and Phil wanted to know where the rush and Dr. Popper manufacturing equipment went. So Phil and I headed to the warehouse together. We opened the doors and all the equipment was gone. The place was completely empty. Rogers had sold everything for seed money in order to try his hand at importing drugs from Mexico. I suppose he figured that it was an easier way to make money than by direct manufacture of drugs. I gently reminded Phil that Johnny had ordered me that this was no longer my factory or equipment, and that Marshall had told me to stay away from it. So I did as I was told. When Joey heard back from Phil, he was unhappy about it, but not angry at me. Using information from Johnny Rogers' statements as he became a, a protected government witness, Caifano was convicted in 79 and sent to Oxford Federal Prison in Wisconsin while JL did some time for his own crimes relating to the Operation Pendorf, which he said that uh, where he and Alan Dorfman had been indicted for trying to bribe the U.S. Senator from Nevada, Howard Cannon, and for racketeering. Bribing the Senator from Nevada, huh? Yeah. Or is it real estate and a trucking deal? It was clear to the prosecutors through the wiretap that they had a solid case. When Joey went away to prison, Alan Dorfman's fate was to be gunned down in front of the Lincoln Wood Hyatt house when he was out on bond and with his trusted friend, Irv Weiner. Alan had been fortunate enough to show enough income on his tax returns to be eligible to make bond. Unlike JL, it was obvious he had been much, uh, he would have been much safer if he had just gone to prison but he simply didn't want to do the time. Allen had been in prison before and thought it was safer to be out on bond until he was shot down, allegedly by Frank Schweiss, near the car that he drove to the Lincolnwood Hyatt House Hotel for lunch with his close friend, Irv Weiner. Irv's statement to the police was that he never saw who did it because he did what he was told, and when someone told him to turn around and put his hands on the car, the thief... Uh, the thieving man said, give me your wallets. Irv told authorities he was just doing as he was told and that he had been in fear of his life during the armed robbery. This is the way it was done by the outfit. 
Someone you trust would bring you to a place and you never return from it. You were led to your murder by a close friend and trusted friend who you never suspect to betray you. That's it. It's never somebody that doesn't know you, right? It's it's never a, a stranger. Oh, it's a close friend. It's someone you trust. Got it. Yeah, Adam, like like Joe's story about buying boxing tickets. Yeah, buying the damn toy trucks. <laughs> exactly. Bobby bag of donuts. Mark Hansen shoots his brother. Whew, this sounds like a normal family already. After a normal late night. Oh, Mark Hansen. Story, Mark Hansen is the son of Kenny Hansen. Okay. After a normal late night closing of the bar, I set the front door buzzers so that I wouldn't so I wouldn't hear it ring. Shut off the ringers on the phones and then crawled into bed. I'd only been asleep for about an hour and a half when I was awakened by someone pounding on my back door. I had no doorbell on that back door, which was uh, of heavy duty, solid wood construction with a pair of deadbolts for added security. My back door was on the second floor. I had an elaborate deterrent system in place to keep people out of the backyard slash beer garden. So I was shocked to hear anyone pounding on it. I got out of bed and I grabbed my pistol and headed to the back. With my 45 in hand, I opened the locks with my left hand and prepared for the worst. I didn't know what to expect. I then heard, it's Mark, it's Mark, open the door. I opened it and saw a frightened Mark Hansen. His curly light brown hair was all over the place. He was in some dirty work clothes that looked and smelled like he'd come straight from the barn. Mark was running his own place. Glenwood Stables. I know. I remember Glenwood Stables. I grew up not I'm far. Glenwood from... Dyer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. By now, uh, and was doing quite well for himself. I asked him how he'd gotten up to my door. He was frazzled, and he kept saying, "I killed my brother. I killed my brother, and I'm going to prison for the rest of my life." He was emotionally distraught and disturbed. I pulled him into my kitchen, and I secured the door, and I asked him why he would come to my place. He told me <laughs> he didn't there? help. Yeah, why, why are you here? Right here. <laughs> You're at the police station, shouldn't you? I asked him why he would come to my place. He told me he needed help and wanted to hide out there. That I was the only one he could trust. I put, put my robe on and I asked him to tell me one more time about what had happened while we stood in the kitchen together. He kept repeating the same phrase. I killed my brother. I killed my brother. I'm going to prison for the rest of my life. He was scared had, to death. I had to coax more information out of him as he was still in shock and tears ran down his cheeks. I asked him how he killed him and he replied, I shot him with this as he pulled a nickel plated 25 automatic. I soon became more awake as I laid eyes on the firearm. I removed the pistol from his hand and I put it on the dryer that was next to the door. His lip was quivering and his hands were shaking as we continued our exchange of information. He had to use the bathroom, so I told him to get in the. Sh I told him to get in the shower as I got a robe for him and put his dirty clothes into the washing machine. While he showered, I went and woke up Lenny. He was none too thrilled with the prospect of helping out with another problem child. Mark finished showering and put on one of my robes, uh, but hung it on him like a blanket, owning to his small build. His clothes were still in the wash as we stood in the kitchen while he sat on top of the dryer. He was still upset, but at least he was clean. At this point, I asked him a few questions, so I was very curious about things. I'd asked him how he'd gotten into the city, and he told me I took the, I took Ma's car. You mean you, you mean her brand new Lincoln? He confirmed that the car, he, he confirmed that was the car he drove in, also, also telling me that he had parked it in the parking lot. I asked him which one, and then learned it was Frank Schweiss's. Frank had a habit of taking sledgehammer to the car of anyone who used his parking stalls without authorization and then called Lincoln Towing Company to take the vehicle away. He didn't just call to have it towed. He smashed it up first. And oh, then yeah. Jesus. Things just seemed to keep getting worse. As Mark continued babbling about how he killed his brother, I asked, where did you shoot him? He began to tell me a story. He said that he was trying to call his girlfriend, Joni, and the phone just kept ringing. He tried and tried again. When it was finally answered, his brother, Danny, was the one who was on the other line. He told me that he hung up and drove straight to her house, taking his pistol with him. He told me that the reason he brought the pistol was to intimidate his brother since he didn't want to get beaten up by him. 
When Mark arrived at Joni's house, her parents were on vacation, leaving the house to their daughter. When Mark knocked, she answered, but refused to let him into the house. Asserting his masculinity, Mark pushed his way through the door. The commotion at the door brought Danny to investigate. He emerged from the bedroom only wearing his underwear, threatening his brother and telling him to get out of there, or he was going to call the police. Mark took the pistol out of his pocket and pointed it at Danny. Danny reached for the phone. Mark extended his hand and told him to put the phone down or he would shoot him. Danny looked at him and told him, you don't have the balls. Mark <laughs> told me, I just did like you taught me, Red, so I extended my arm as far as I could, held the pistol with both hands, closed my eyes before I shot. <laughs> I didn't that, that's how you taught him. You taught him, close <laughs> your eyes and then shoot. But I did just like you taught me. <laughs> I appeared, Mar it appeared Mark expected me to approve of his shooting techniques that I had taught him while out at the barn. I remember thinking tongue in cheek, this is not what I, this is not how I taught him. While Mark's eyes were closed, Danny held out his hand and Mark heard him say, don't shoot. When Mark opened his eyes to see the results of his shot, there was blood everywhere and his brother was laying on the floor of the kitchen. Mark then told me, quote, I took Joni, put her in the car and drove her straight here figuring I could just hide out here with you. I asked him where Joni was now, and he told me she was waiting out in the car that Frank Schweiss is about to bust with a sledgehammer. It had been close to an hour by now, and I was wondering if she had left the car and created a scene in her own right. Putting her in, on hold in my mind, I asked Mark where he actually hit Danny with the bullet. He said, I don't know, because my eyes were shut. So I didn't see, but there was blood everywhere. He wasn't moving when I left. His clothes were now his clothes were now done, the wash cycle, so I moved him to the dryer as we continued. We went to the living room where Lenny was eavesdropping on the entire conversation. I reached for a telephone as I asked Mark what town Joni lived in. I wanted to see where the nearest hospital was so I could determine where Danny had been taken. The nearest hospital was South Suburban, so I dialed 411, got their number, made the call. When the gal answered the phone, I asked to transfer to the emergency room. After eight or nine rings, a woman answered. I told her I was checking on the condition of Daniel Hansen. She said, one moment, put me on hold. The whole time I was thinking that they had put a trace on the call and the police would answer from there in an emergency room. To my surprise, Danny was the one who answered with a gruff, hello? With that, I quickly hung up the phone without saying a word. I looked at Mark and said, well, there's good news and bad news. Your brother's shot. But he's alive, <laughs> which was the good news. He's alive. Okay. Mark now changed his mantra to his mantra to I'm going to prison. I'm going to prison. I'm going to prison. His clothes were finally dried by now. And I told him to get, um, to get them out of the dryer and get dressed. While Mark was in the bathroom getting dressed, Lenny looked over to me and said, this is another one of your fine messes, Red. How did you get me in? How do you get me involved in these things? In an authoritative voice, I told him, just shut up. I'm going to need your help. Lenny took a deep breath and said, okay. I told Lenny to turn on the TV on the early morning news, and the same story was on every channel. The news reported that a young South Suburban man had shot his brother, kidnapped a young woman, was armed and dangerous, and on the run. Great, and he's with you. And I'm looking at this on TV. Mark exited the bathroom. 6 a.m. news. <laughs> Just in time to catch a report as the picture of both he and Joni flashed on the screen with their names and ages beneath each photo. He again affirmed that he was going to he was going to be going to prison where he would be sexually abused and molested. I sat Mark down and told him he was not going to prison. And if he would listen to me and do exactly as I instructed, the first thing you're going to do now, now that you're dressed, is go go down and get your girlfriend and bring her back up here. Mark became more alert as he began Im to implicitly follow my instructions, even though he was still scared. As he went down to the door to retrieve Joni, I picked up the phone and called his mother. When she answered the phone, she told me, I can't talk to you right now. There's a lot of police in the house with a search warrant looking for guns. She then hung up. I began disassembling Mark's pistol, deliberately damaging it as I broke it down into individual pieces. Mark returned to the back door with his girlfriend, and we all sat in the living room. As I introduced myself and Lenny to her, I asked if she was okay. She was most concerned about her mental state at the time and wondered 
the circum what the circumstances of her kidnapping were. I was afraid that she wouldn't speak to me openly with Mark there beside her. So I instructed Lenny to take Mark for a ride in the car and get some Dunkin' Donuts as I needed an excuse to get Mark out of the apartment. As Lenny began to leave, I handed him the damaged pistol parts, telling him to drop, drop one part in one sewer and another in another sewer and to make sure that they were at least a few blocks apart. As they left, it was dark outside. I began talking. I began to talk to Joni now that we were alone. From the news reports, I learned she was 18 years old. She looked very young and innocent. She was commenting that she was going to be in big trouble when her parents got home from their trip, as she'd been told not to have anyone over while they were out of town. She was a slim, attractive girl with a long chestnut hair, a bit taller than Mark, around 5'8". I asked her if she was being held against her will, and she said no. She told me that she willingly accompanied Mark to the city. I told her, you can leave at any time if you want to. I can call you a cab for you or anything you need. She said, no, that's okay. I love him. We even made out a little bit in his mom's car right in the parking lot before he came up to see you. Uh, I'll wait until Mark gets back before I do anything. I hope he follows your instructions. You seem to be a very smart man. I was glad she was being so candid with me. I could tell um, I, could tell I had her confidence, even if the perspective of those events was, uh, was vastly different from mine. When Mark and Lenny returned, I told Lenny to go back and get the, and get the donuts, which he had forgotten in all the excitement, and told him to take Joni along this time. I asked Mark for his father's number, um, and, um, as I had not been in contact with Kenny for several years. Reluctantly, he gave it to me, saying, please don't call him, he'll turn me in. I called his father, and we had a short conversation in a cryptic way of speaking. I asked him if he'd seen the news. He assumed that Mark was with me. He asked to talk to Mark, but Mark shook his head as he overheard the conversation. Kenny and I discussed Danny's condition. He told me Danny would be out of the hospital in two days. I told him to do me a favor and have Danny get in touch with me if he could. He asked me if Mark was okay in a morbid fashion, telling me, I told him if my brother did that to me, I'd be waiting in the weeds with a gun. He furthered the conversation with, we have to get him out of the country. This was Kenny's code for out of the state. He, used, um, he always used the royal we whenever he spoke about himself. He was cool, calm, and collected as he talked things over with me. The pieces came together for me as I talked to Kenny as to why Mark had shot his brother. I said goodbye to Kenny and hung up the phone. I asked Joni, as she had returned from the donut run, if she had a driver's license and knew how to drive a car. She told me she did. I told her to drive the Lincoln back to Beverly's place. She agreed. I told her, when the police question you, tell them you dropped Mark off on the highway somewhere outside of Indiana. She assured me that she'd make it sound convincing. She did exactly as I instructed. Mark began, uh, Mark begged me to let him stay in my apartment building. I told him that was out of the question and that he would do everything precisely as I told him if he wanted to stay out of prison. I'll do exactly as you say, Red. I just hope it works, as the tears continue to roll down his cheeks. I called a former employee of mine who lived a couple thousand miles away and told him that a young man named Mark was going to come and stay out with him and that I would talk to him later. He agreed to let Mark stay with him and then hung up the phone. I called the airlines and I made a 1.30 p.m. reservation under my own name for a flight as I paid for it with my credit card. I then called up my father and told him to come to my apartment immediately. He said he was on the way and he hung up the phone. I told Mark to empty his pockets and his jeans, including his wallet. He took his driving's license, credit cards, or anything else that could identify him and put him into an envelope. Mark had never been on an airplane, uh, never been on an airplane in his life, much less a jet. He told me he was afraid of flying, but not as afraid as he was as going to prison. I put the envelope away. I took 2,500 cash, gave it to, um, and gave the cash and Mark's empty wallet to him. I told him my father would be driving him to the airport. It also bears mentioning that all throughout the exchanges, Mark was clutching a Bible close to his chest, rocking back and forth. He again pleaded with me to stay, but that was simply way out of the question and not up for discussion. When my father arrived, I told him that I wanted to take Mark to the airport to pretend that he was one of his sons. Still holding his Bible, Mark now reached up and gave me a big hug as he and my father left. He told Mark 
to call me. Sorry, I told Mark to call me when he arrived at his destination and to call me once a week, give me regular updates. I explicitly instructed him to leave the tickets bearing my name uh, in his seat on the plane as he left. My dad returned, telling me that the airline had a problem with him getting on the plane since Mark didn't have a, any ID. But my father's assurance that he was his son while showing him his own ID was enough to get him boarded. Mark safely arrived in the new city and called me collect to confirm he was there and that everything was going as planned. And I think that's about where my voice will get me today because it's starting to go. I have, I have to tell you, there was hours. never anything so shocking. I was taping Frank Schweiss while this was going on. Uh -huh. And this kid shows up at the door and says, I just killed my, my brother. That's all I needed. <laughs> And he was a little guy. He was a little guy. Wiry, you know. He probably didn't weigh 110 pounds at the most. Fascinating. This is a fascinating read, Red. It, it is. And we're about, I'm looking at the marker. We're about halfway through this thing. Not quite halfway, but we're close. And what is this, episode five? I said it was going to take, I said it was going to take 12. After we did the first one, I said this is going to be a 12 episode thing. I know it is. That's how long it's going to take to do this. 12 hours of reading it out loud. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Not all at once, thank God. But, you know, once the playlist is together, you can binge through it. If you, you know, once it's done, that's the whole point of it. So I hope you guys are enjoying this. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to grab some uh, honey and tea. I have to do that right now because I got to start talking again in a little bit. So, all right, Red. Well, it's been fun. Thank you, folks. Thank you, folks. Thank you for stopping by. God bless you all. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you next week, and uh, we'll learn more about Red. The combination of the videotapes and we Met's testimony resulted in the conviction of two men on extortion charges. One of them was Frank Schweiz, known in syndicate circles as the German, a feared mob terrorist and a suspect in a number of gangland murders. He was described to me by other outfit individuals as uh, the most feared hitman. And... Uh, as he said to me, my reputation precedes me, son.